Hello, hello. Welcome to another edition of Watch Me Work, uh, where, funnily enough, you watch me at work. Um, I've been creating this character uh, for a client of mine, um, and uh, he is pretty much done. Um, he's been a test case for a new mouth design, which I've been looking into and working on, which I'm happy to say has worked out very, very well indeed. Um, let me just show off his capabilities. So if I just move it to a more appropriate frame, you'll be able to get the idea of what's going on. So he has the ability to do all of this lovely, luscious mouth movement here. And I can change his expression at will and make him do that sort of thing. And he can sort of go back and I can make him go ooh, ooh, and I can go meh, 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 that sort of thing. So it's it's a very flexible mouth situation and I've got the ability as well to sort of manipulate um, the actual mouth shape itself and get you know some extra looks there going on so it's extremely flexible and I'm really really happy it's just um, I'm using this project as a kind of test case for um, being able to do this kind of work so it's um it on the whole looking very very good indeed and i'm very pleased and i'm i'm going to be putting this into my toon boom cookbook as soon as i can um he's got uh, a head turn it only goes as far as like sort of uh well, it's not even a full 90 degrees but that's all i need for this particular project he's sort of looking in this general direction so that's fine and he can blink and that sort of stuff so it's um it's it's set up now the thing is with him and uh, the way he's designed is that um i want to be able to um i want to be able to pretty much use most of how this is rigged on two characters so as i say at the moment i've got um him all set up but now i want to make her set up as well so she's got a fairly similar structure so what I'm going to do is essentially take all the rigging from him and to redraw all bits and pieces as Olivia here. So uh, I'm not entirely sure this is going to work. <laughs> so we'll see. Hopefully this will be a way of saving me some time. So the first thing I need to do is to relabel her. Whoops. Already we've hit the snag. Relabel her. There we go. I'll call it Olivia G. The reason being is that I like the overall peg to be just called the character's name. Oh, Lord. Wait a moment. Thank you. This uh, is just a drawing I did on my iPad. And then I, did, I want this to be the character's name, so I'll call that Olivia. There you go, like that. And now, as you can see, on the timeline, at its most root level, I've got a character called Olivia. And because the peg is outside the uh, group, it allows the um, software to show a full keyframe in black and if there's any tweening between the points. So it's very useful to have a peg outside of a group in this way, the sort of overall peg. Um, now, the way I structure the innards for all of this sort of stuff is um, I have uh, the head and the body grouped as separate subgroups within that. And um, I'm just going to change that, by the way. There we go. Um, save that. Uh, so that way I've got the ability to, if I just collapse that there, and then when you see when I do that, you've got clearly defined timelines for both the head and the body here and that makes it a lot easier to cut and paste uh, animation and reuse stuff so it's just a nice little method that i keep getting into um, also that one is for the controls so i'm just going to rename that controls just a second oops there we go um all of this is going to be complete. Well, I'll leave it in there and then we can change it at the very end. Some of the controls we'll keep, some of them we won't have to remake completely. And uh, just change that to there. Not entirely sure how many other 
places there are for this kind of thing but there we go uh, we've got that situation going on as well I remember because I've made this character already and put it into the library and there are a few changes that I made like this because there's no need for two inputs but exactly the same so if I do that just cleans things up a little bit there there we go hope everyone's all right um I'm okay now I've uh, I had a bit of a wobble at the beginning of the week mentally um I think it was just lack of sleep there's all sorts of things like that so I've got a better duvet now it seems to be helping things along um it seems to allow me to sleep properly throughout the night now then not that you want to hear about my <laughs> sleeping arrangements but there we go now what I've got to do is uh let me see yeah whatever um is um I've got to create a new palette call it Olivia there we go just whoosh back and then um I think what I'll do since the line is probably going to be the same is if I copy the color ID and paste it uh can I do that here Mm. Paste. Yeah. Okay, can I do that at all? Paste color values. Can't do that. Can I do it here? Mm. That's interesting. Paste color values. Paste as new colors. Paste as clones. Can't actually do it though. Mm. Palettes, colors. Can I do it here maybe? Copy. Oh, here we are. Right, so I want to just paste this clone. There we go. And then I've got exactly the same line. Now, this is because I know that the line is going to be the same for both of them. I'm going to allow myself that one. But everything else is going to be completely different. So um, I'm going to allow myself a new skin color. And because I want to know that I've done a different skin color, I want to color it green at the moment. Um, because it's quite similar, so I really want to make sure that I know that it is a different colour. Uh, rare, um, what do they call it? Top jumper, outfit, shirt. Ah, oh, what is she wearing? Um, oh, I don't know. Snood, snood. I'll call it snood. There you go. Um, that colour I can grab from there thank you very much um her hair will be kind of a mixture i'm still not quite sure how i'm going to do the texturing for this um i haven't quite made my mind up yet so uh i'm getting the main bits and pieces sorted out and then i can sort of add that in later it might just be a case of painting a rough texture on them but i'm not entirely sure um uh, now let me see lipstick I've been watching quite a lot of um, Rapunzel the animated series uh, recently I've never really seen it before I've got Disney Plus now so I can watch it I'm very frustrated that um, it's only got series one it hasn't got series two or three so when the plot really starts to heat up and it does actually have quite a decent, interesting idea of a plot. Um, it 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 stops. <laughs> You're thinking, oh, I don't know what are the rocks about. Well, how does this work? Why is why has she got a special power in her hair? Which is all I know. It's all of these things are told in the next few series because they talk about this um, in clips on YouTube. So I've seen all these fantastic clips, but I can't watch the flipping thing and that really is annoying to me because uh, I'm quite into it I'm quite impressed at how they've managed to flesh out that show as well because when you look at I mean Rapunzel in itself is quite a short story I'm not talking about the Disney interpretation I'm talking about the original you know woman has long hair man climbs up and saves her all the stuff with the the um, Wicked Witch and everything else. I'm not. Maybe there was a version with the Wicked Witch. Perhaps there was. If she's locked in a tower room, 
But um, certainly a magic golden flower and Flynn Rider and, you know, all of the other stuff that makes Tangled what it is. I mean, that's all a Disney invention. Um, I think that's enough. I think apart from the weird skin, that's fine. I'm just going to get rid... Mm, should I? Do? Um, actually, no, I won't get rid of all of this yet. Um, these are keyframes that I have special meaning for the construction of the mouth and the face and everything. Even though it looks weird, they are actually correct, or at least some of them are. Um, so, uh, you know, I want to leave that for now. Uh, so let's concern ourselves, excuse me, <laughs> with uh, the construction of the body and stuff. Now, the way I put this together is um, it structurally is going to be the same as uh, Olivia, but it's going to be the other way round. Uh, I don't really want to flip it. I want to kind of make it the correct way round. So what I'll do is... Um, well, first of all, I want to get rid of the um, colour. Because uh, the way I do it is I colour the actual, if you see there, the colour butts up onto the pencil line. And because I'm going to move the pencil line, the colour will be, won't move with it, you see. If I, if I start moving that around, it, it won't come. So there's no point in keeping it. So I shall get rid of that. And um, I think these little flecks I'll also get rid of because there's absolutely no reason to keep those. In fact, what I might do to start with is to just erase all of that and then we know where we are right so that's that that's that um the ears are virtually the same i could probably just shrink them and alter them a bit so i actually leave them in uh that one uh don't need any of that at all um actually might i'll keep the outline in because of course i need to oops Ah, I see, that's what I did. Oh, well, I'll leave that on then. Oh, what am I doing? Turn off, you. Uh, what I'll do is just alter the shape of it a little bit at the moment, and then I'll probably... The construction of her nose is quite different to his. I'll leave it in there as a placeholder, but um, it is very different shape. The mouth I'm going to leave... Well, actually, the mouth I'm going to completely erase because that needs special setting up and it won't work for her position in this way. So I'm just going to go in there and I'm going to get rid of the auto mouth, I think. Um, let me just... Yeah, they're the controls. I see. Well, what I'll do then... I'll leave the auto mouth in, but I will get rid of it later on. Um, the eyes are virtually the same. So again, I'll leave those in and just make some alterations. I think her pupils are slightly larger. Um, her, his hair is completely different um, in construction and in look. So I think that will probably be the only bit that I redo entirely. So I will get rid of the hair. Now what's happening there? They're all going into that. Oh yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so I'll just get rid of that. Thank you. So now bald. And um, yeah, that's all good. The neck probably virtually the same. There's a slight difference in construction. Um, yeah, okay. So what I'll do is for that, I'll just change the skin color and change that. And that. There we go. So now I can tell, apart from the hands, that is completely different. Now the hands, I'm going to leave because what I want to do is have the same hands for both characters. And if I keep them um, as clones all the way through, I'll, I'll change her hands at the very end so that they're clones of uh, Robert's character. Uh, what I can do is recolor them using a color override node, um, and then I get the best of both worlds then. So I'm using the clones of Robert character, 
but then recolouring them to make them into uh, Olivia. And with the uh, colour override node, you can do, do all sorts of other things like retexture them, uh, change. I think you can change the the thickness of the line, things like that. The fundamental drawing stays the same, but the, the appearance can be altered. So I'm going to keep it that way. Now uh, the this stuff, this is actually going to be a different shape altogether. She's got a slightly different shaped arm. Um, but if I just, which layer are we on? There we are. If I just change that to the snood, and uh, you notice that they both change because they're clones of one another, the drawings are. Change that as well. Now this part here effectively is this part here. So the drawing may change, but the role it plays in the rest of it is virtually, pardon me, virtually the same. Um, virtually, I say, it's not quite the same. Um, I've got the ability to move, oops, move that around. I see, like that. Um, it may do a little bit of a dance here, actually. Um, hmm. I want, oh, okay, so I've connected that to the, I see. So by grabbing that, I'm grabbing, if you, sorry, oh, yeah. So by grabbing that, I'm also grabbing the torso in many respects. So I think that's gonna be a little bit different, but yeah. Well, for now, let's just, Make that into the same color, there we go. It's roughly right. Um, and then in terms of the hands, as I say, what we can do is put a color override node here, um, which would be anywhere really. I mean, it could be there, it could be there, whatever. Let's put it here. And then instead of, um, what do I say here? Buh, 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 buh. Um, Olivia, skin, change it to, and then you put the color you want in. So um, this would be the Rob thing, actually. Get rid of that and change it to that. And then with a bit of luck, there we go. So it's changing it from the palette's color to a color that you pick. I think there is a way to change the color to another color in the palette, but I, I can't remember. Um, modulate, la la la. I could look into it actually. Overwrite this to, because I only get a color picker, you see. So I think I do actually have to just pick the color. I don't think I can get it from another source. There may be some way around it. I, I really don't know um, as yet. Yeah, I really can't see one, if you know what I mean, to just get it from, from another palette in the usual sort of block color ID kind of a way, swap a color ID around. Um, there may be, as I say, there may be a way to do it, but I don't know it. <laughs> I don't know it. It's as simple as that. Right, okay, I'm going to duplicate that. I'm going to put it on the other hand. Oh, sorry, we're already on that one. Right, and there we go. So now we've colored both hands the same. Now this line boil, oh yeah, but that's uh, an overhang of something that I did before that doesn't work. There we go. Right, okay. So we've got the basics down and now because they're all recolored properly I can do the actual coloring of her flesh which is like that and the only things that will be wrong is her hands which I now need to do in the same way so it was a bit premature of me really to do it that way never mind there we go so we've got one hand there and then arm B come on come on and change that green to that. There we go. Now we have got them the right color to her flesh there. Now, this is the tricky bit. I have to start 
making her... I've got to face her the other way and everything. It's going to be very interesting and I've got to do it properly. So let me find the eye. I've got all of that to look forward to. Uh, okay. Well, these should be zero at the beginning, so that's good. Yeah, okay. Right, okay then. So move that eye to the correct place. So, oh, lordy loo. That's it. Um, I've put constraints in these, you see. So, you know, you have to be handled more manually than you would move something normally. It's worth doing, even though it's a bit of a pain, all of this. Because, um, you know, there's going to be a bit of shuffling around, I can tell, but it will save time. Um, there we are. And uh, nose. There's the nose. There we are. Again, I'm not even going to flip the nose around. I'm going to draw it in the other direction. So it's it really is just roughly lining something up. I can change the pivot and all of that sort of stuff in a bit. So you're going to get a very garbled <laughs> character to start with, and then it will all make sense. Um, I think it's okay to just resize these for this. That's fine. Uh, and same with that. And, of course, that'll be behind the main structure. There's going to be a lot of shuffling around. Uh, I'm going to get rid of the deformations because that's there's absolutely no reason to keep them at all until I've redrawn it. So get rid of that and the jaw as well. Um, I want to try and retain the height of the jaw because if I do this, there we go, um, there's constraint on the entire jaw there. Actually, it doesn't really matter so much for the jaw's base, but for the top. Um, this is the squishiness between the two, and there's a reason why it's quite so long. It means that it sort of retains a kind of gravitational direction for the whole thing, whereas if it's up here, it tends to bend a bit too violently. Um, so this helps to sort of ease it out. Uh, there was a reason for it anyway. It's been a while <laughs> since I did it. So suffice to say, there is a reason why this line is quite so long. So anyway, I'm just going to... In, in case you're not sure what's going on here, um, there's a nail here, a lower nail, and in this case there's actually a third one to soften uh, the the point here uh, for the jaw when it when he she talks. Uh, so it's uh, it's a little involved, but it's not terribly complicated really once you get into it. Anyway, let me just alter where that goes so she doesn't really have a very pronounced cheek line so i'm going to try and make that butt up can i just see where i pulled it from yeah uh, so i'm just going to make it butt up with the rest of the face here and then um i'm gonna shape it so that it's subtler um, her eyes are too close together as well, so I'll have to adjust that in a second. But let me just do, as I say, there's going to be a lot of shuffling around um, for her. But there we go. So round her head off. There we go, like that. That's starting to go in the right direction. And she has a nice sort of sharp, she has a sharp jaw and she actually has two, she has something that sort of happens there, doesn't she? Um, yeah, like that. It's a sort of wiggle that happens, which is rather sweet. Um, there we go, like that. And the same there. Okay, we'll see how we get on. It's very hard to tell at the moment because of everything being such a Picasso-like jumble. Um, 
I mean, I could have had a, like a drawing over the of the back of it, but uh, I don't know. I I think you know, we'll see how I get on. Um, you know, this is not an ideal situation because you're having to sort of squish existing assetry to the wrong place. So you're not in an ideal situation from the off, really. There we go. Um, her eyes are definitely, oops, are definitely bigger. And her pupils, which I will redraw actually, are definitely bigger. That helps to understand what the character needs a bit more. Oops, right, okay. Ah, okay. Have I been, ah, okay then. Right, so that really does need bigging up in that way then. Okay. Right, so that's that. Now the nose is completely awful, but um, in order to sort of grab hold of what I'm doing in any way that makes sense, I've now got to start filling this stuff in. So <clears throat> for now, I will put the skin on like that and then just cut and paste it in there like that. It won't there will be a few er errors in it, which I know about, but I'd rather do that at this stage so that I can make some adjustments and then when I'm happy, then I'll go and slightly cut the, uh, manually cut it up to there so that I can um, blend it all together properly. I'm just separating the line and the colour art to their respective sub layers and then magic stuff happens where they group together. But um, those who are in the know will know that the colour art is probably eating onto the actual line art here. I have to say it looks jolly good. Not as ugly as I thought it might, so that's something. Um, right. Okay, eye again. I've got to move that eye there. The nose, I'm going to make some attempt at trying to redraw it right now. So um, I'll take the artwork and flip it using, come on, using that. Now she doesn't have any nostrils, so the nostril artwork can be removed. Um, however, is it sensible to replace it with something else? Um, I may do that instead so that there's some kind of difference between the two. So what she's got, she's kind of got a base here and then a little bit there, which probably disappears depending on which angle she's facing at. So I don't think you ever see her so profile that you actually see the outline of her nose, but I would like to have that as an option anyway. So what I'll do is I'll do the base and the, the bit top the sort of uh, there's probably a, a biological name for it but I don't know so base there we go and then um, I'll just call it long and then the nose can actually have that right so <clears throat> so the long part um, can get rid of those and shift it up to there and then we've got that and then what I need to do is check yeah there you go so uh, get rid of most of this I'm just uh, going into the line what's it called the pencil editor tool and just changing things around a bit Ah, oh. What animation-y things have I seen recently? Um, there's the Manchester Animation Festival that's on coming up, uh, which, yet again, I probably won't be able to go to because uh, too busy. Um, <clears throat> I mean, usually I like to have any excuse to go to Manchester. Love it up there. I used to work there. Um absolutely adore the people, the city, 
it's it's lovely absolutely adore every every ounce of it and the people are really friendly as well um why did i leave work uh why did i go there work uh it was as simple as that for both for both things but um yeah it's um it's one of those situations where you go because uh, dear, got a texture on it um you go because you know there's just nothing for you at, there at the time i was working at um i was working at cosgrove hall at the time that i left um it was quite a i was quite a, i was quite happy to work at cosgrove hall and then um uh, Ardman came a knocking, and that was the place I always, always, always wanted to work. So I, I said, I've got to go, guys. Um, I was getting small contracts from uh, Cosgrove anyway. That's how they did things there for most people, and uh, I, so I wasn't sh entirely sure if they needed me for much longer anyway. So I just went. There we go. And. Uh, yeah, and now Cosgrove Hall are no longer there, and it's all because I wasn't there. No, it's not that. <laughs> no, it, I think it was on a slow, sad decline, really, since the days of uh, Thames Television, really, after Thames lost the franchise. Well, yeah, after Thames lost the franchise, Cosgrove never were able to really get themselves together, sadly, after that. So it was, uh, it was a sad thing, really, because they're a beloved company um, by... What am I doing, Rob? Um, come on, Phil, Phil, Phil. Yeah, they were a beloved company by all who sailed in her. Um, you know, it's about there, isn't it? And then the long part would be. I'll just pull. Oops, I'll pull that down. So uh, yeah, Cosgrove um, were a great. I'm glad. I'm so glad I got a chance to work there before they closed down because it is a bit of a British institution, really. Um, it made so many cartoons uh, and animated series, both stop motion and two dimensional, um, that it's still got a bit of a cachet, really. Um, I don't know how long that'll last, sadly, because a lot of people just don't know who they are now. Um, but uh, they were a big deal at one point um and uh now they're not what is that what is this oh it's part of that okay well, i can get rid of that it's probably on that layer yeah get rid of that one any others no okay so um yeah so there was that kind of thing and i worked on oh, fatten those ears as well um yeah i worked there for just under a year um and it was a happy time. I worked with a friend of mine, sadly no longer with us, Lisa Jane Gray, and she was a brilliant director there. Um, I keep saying this, and I will keep saying it, um, most of the people that I've worked with that have been good directors have been women. And I learned, I think when you come out of college, especially if you're a bloke, you read all these things these books on how to direct you know you read about Tim Burton you read about Spielberg and you're all excited and whatever and it's a very male approach usually to direction it's always very much you know one man's vision about blah 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 and uh, you know they um, they make amazing films and you look at this as a student you think oh that's the way you must do it then I must become this little dictator man um, telling everybody what to do and everything. And the female approach, by and large, I mean, this isn't always true, but the female approach is a lot more, here's the feeling I want for the scene. Here's also what needs to happen. You know, the character needs to go bum, 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 over here to pick up a glass and bum, 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 bum. But, you know, they're feeling happy. And there'd be a lot more into, you know, how's the character's day going and all that sort of stuff. So that's, you know, that side of thing is really enriching as an actor um, because you are getting much more of a feel of what the character's motivations are, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and 
I found that a lot of the time the female directors really unashamedly talk about that sort of thing. And it is something which, of course, directors need to do, but women directors seem to channel that a lot more. And the crucial difference is that female directors tend to say, OK, this is the atmosphere I want. It's much more about the ambience and the sort of thing. And then over to you. I'm not going to give you any more direction than that. You do you. You know, you bring to the table what you feel is best for the scene. I'm not going to dictate every bloody thing, you know. And because of that, not only do you have a cracking good time animating, but you do, because you want to impress and you want to, you know, you want to do the very best by the director who has put faith in you, you end up doing much better quality work, I think. Um, you want to do the very best for the person and because they've trusted you you're not you're buoyed up your confidence is higher you know if you've got somebody saying now you've got you need to put this on frame 44 and then that has to happen and then that has to happen and then that has to happen and then this has to happen okay off you go and then you've con you've already got some horrible sense of um you know You've got too many parameters in place to the point where you, you're not entirely sure you can meet the demands that the scene requires, you know. Um, so I think I think it's quite scary when directors do that. And they don't, you know, my choir master um, from my choir days um, taught me quite a lot about direction, really. I mean, choir masters, because of the very nature of what they do, uh, if you don't know, choir master is essentially a conductor uh, for a choir. They're the ones that sort of organise the piece of music to get you feeling the piece. They're the director of the music, uh, among other things. But in terms of artistic side of things, they are the director of the music, really. They're making sure that the music sounds the way they want it to and it's interpreted in the way that they think it ought to be. And he taught me quite a lot about how to communicate what you want with people you are working with, you know? Um, you do it in a way where... Just trying to figure out what the heck that line is. What is that line? Sorry, I've got to figure this out. Uh, mm, 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 mm. Ah, there it is. Probably needed for something else later, but we'll figure it out. Anyway... I think it's the blinking. In fact, I know it's the blinking. What am I saying? Right, I've uh, just got to quickly tiddle around with that. There you go. I think that'll work. Right. Um, yeah. Um, he, he was a fantastic communicator. He would be able to say, this is what I want, in such a way where you felt that you were giving the best of what you could give. I know it's a, it's a very sort of, you know, I don't want to sound all poncy about it because it does sound like, you know, you've gone out there, you've given it 110%, you've done all this, you've done all that, and you went out there and you did it. And I, ugh, you know, I, it's that's ri dripping in cliche and meaningless guff. It doesn't mean anything. Um, if you're able to just talk to somebody in a way where, um, I have to take that line, um, where um, they feel confident. That's largely what it is. I mean, you're dealing with people all the time in art, generally, who are severely underconfident. That, by the very nature of what's actually going on, um, you're not confident because you are self-critical. Most of the best artists are massively self-critical um i could have done this better i want to do this better i could do this i shan't do this i won't do this i could do this you know it's all of that so it takes somebody else to constantly drip feed you you're doing okay you're doing well well done well done well done heaps of praise and not mindless praise but actually commenting on things in an intelligent way but also trying to improve them at the same time but very much psychologically, not just saying, this is shit, or this is rubbish. Blah, blah, blah. You know, you've got to do it in a very diplomatic manner, you know. So um, I think 
There you go, that's looking more like her, isn't it? Ignore this slash <laughs> across her face. Um, yeah, that's looking quite good. I've got to do her eyebrows a little bit differently. Um, that means also that I've got to do the... Well, actually, maybe I don't have to do the eyebrows differently. Just thinking about that. Maybe I don't have to... Maybe I don't. Maybe I don't. No. Um, anyway, so, yeah, I think he was a fantastic motivator and communicator of what he wanted without sounding like some demi dictator you know an ur stalin as um stephen fry would say um so yeah i think he was he was brilliant like that and i owe a lot to he influenced how i approach things quite a bit i think i mean as a teacher in your teaching role you have to by the very nature of it, you are in a patronising position. You are saying to somebody, I know best, or I know something that you don't know. And it's tricky to, it do not always succeed, getting it to the other person without it sounding patronising, or without them being belittled by the information that you're giving over. I mean, God, it's the worst thing as a teacher to make somebody feel little. It's awful. It's like, oh my God, that's not at all what I want. I want you to grow, love, love, you know. Um, but occasionally, because of what you're, how you're trying to do it, sometimes it just, unfortunately, comes out that way. So it's always that delicate balance of trying to say things without saying them in a nasty way or in a sort of uh, way that you don't understand what I'm saying. Uh, this isn't right, you know. Um, and he was fantastic at that. He would, you know, he considering he was um, obviously so much older than all us boys, he would communicate with us in a way that was still of authority and we knew that we had to pull our socks up and listen, uh, whatever, but in a way that didn't feel like he was talking down to us at all. He was so on our level. And that is a gift. I mean, it's it's... It, it came so naturally to him. It was un, it was unbelievable, you know. So, uh, yeah, I owe a lot to that man's uh, personality, really. So, oh, I'm just talking about him. He, uh, it was a great thing to be part of the choir. I don't often talk about the choir. Um, not because I'm ashamed of it or anything like that. It's just, it just doesn't really fit into anything anymore. But um, I think it did, in, it, it allowed me to um, really work on my powers of showmanship and, um, you know, acting and um, I'm trying to think, just the general show busyness of it. Because as I say, we weren't, oops. We weren't part of a normal run-of-the-mill choir. This was a choir that used to go on TV a huge amount and make re do recordings. There's recordings of my voice. If anyone's vaguely interested in hearing a 12-year-old me singing, you know, I think pretty well. I mean, there's some stuff there I still think, ah, oh, I wish, you know, wish I'd done that better. Um, then, you know, feel free to go on iTunes or Spotify or anything and look up uh, Libera and uh, Angel Voices, they would have been called at the time, but Libera is the same. And I am there. Uh, so that's a nice little weird legacy which pops up from time to time. Um, but uh, there we go. I'll just change the posing of the eyebrows. Don't want to keep it on the DreamWorks face. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, okay. So there's a little bit of difference with the ear. I'll figure that out later. Or or not. I might just leave it. <laughs> but she's not bad. Her eye's still a little bit too close together. So I'm going to have to just... Oopsie-doo. Um, come on. There we go. I think talking about um, mindfulness and the fact that I wasn't too great earlier on in the uh, week, I think another role that played its part was, um, pardon me, excuse me, uh, not eating properly. I think um, 
I don't think I ate very well this week. I've I've started to eat well again, but um, it's funny how it creeps up on you, doesn't it? Oh, I'll just have this, and I'll just have that, and I won't bother. And then you realise, oh, hang on, I'm feeling tight, as if I don't have enough energy. I mean, uh, and then it makes you feel stressed and anxious, and God knows what. It's it's subtle, but it all has a knock-on effect, doesn't it? That's why your mother says, you know, why are you not eating enough? And all that. Have you had your tea? As um, they used to joke. Um, right. Okay. Uh, let's pop that up there like that. The usual female trope is to give uh, women bigger eyelashes. Um, actually, that's a bit over the top. I see. I'm always um, the feminist part of me doesn't want to do this, and I don't normally give my women lipstick um, I certainly haven't given her eyelashes in the conventional three flick way but there's part of me that thinks now oh, come on you know let's help the sisterhood by not forcing these these things on but at the same time especially with more stylized characters sometimes you kind of need them just to say this is a this is a female but, I mean, that point is moot these days because of, um, you know, gender roles and, and cis this and whatever as well. So it's, I don't know. It's changed since my day. Uh, I would say for the better, really. But, um, you know, it does mean that you've got to sort of figure out. Okay, that's interesting. That is interesting. Why is that doing that now? I haven't changed anything is that doing it correctly? It is. Okay, yeah. Ignore the... F <laughs> she looks absolutely ghastly, but everything else is fine. Um, she I'm just looking at that. Ignore the mouth. Okay. I think... I think I might just plump out that cheek a little more. So it's more in level with that. So let's see what happens now. That's better. I'm trying to get that cheek more in the right place, and I think that's done it. That's good. Um, okay, now the head itself needs to come further over here. The neck. If I do that and that. Um, mm hmm. Okay, so I'm just being quiet. I need to think of this. Yeah, okay. Um, let me just get that. There we go. And there's a couple of flecks there. I mean, I probably will still be right. I just make her neck a little bit thinner. That's all. Um, there. Yeah, I think that's prettier. And then um, I need to manoeuvre these because at the moment they're in the wrong place. So let's just get that. I don't consider myself very old, really, um, but in the time that um, I've been around, there are huge differences. I've got to acknowledge this. You know, it's... Um, can I not do that? I suppose I haven't built it so it can do that. Yeah, okay. Um... Hmm. Are they both got X values that are the same? Yes, they do. Oh, good. That's handy. So if I move it in X, then it should. Oops. Yeah, there we go. Great. And then move that back. Lovely. Okay, right. Good. And good. Oh, except for the hand. Let me just move that forwards. There we go. Lovely. Yeah, there we go. Um, yeah. Uh, what was I saying? Yeah, changes. I mean, it is the classic thing that Abe Simpson says, you know, about ageing. It'll happen to you! And it's so true. 
Um, it's sad but true. Uh, and it happens so quickly, it's almost like it's overnight. Um, that things that you have thought to be pretty much bedrock truths suddenly are as thin as paper thin as light and timeless as paper um, and you have to re-examine things that you thought were absolutely true um, and you often find yourself thinking back to people who you regarded when you were young as old fossils totally differently you think oh actually yeah they were they were like I am now I'll do an old what's going on here um, let's change that uh, you know you don't think of Basil Rathbone for example uh, the not most people don't think of Basil Rathbone but um, you t <laughs> an odd choice of person to think of but you don't think of somebody who is who has played Sherlock Holmes, and I don't mean Benedict Cumberbatch, um, as young ever. You know, you see them as mature men. You know, and the idea that I'm a man with a capital M seems laughable. But there we go. Apparently, I am one. I don't feel like well I don't, I don't feel really any different to how I was when I was in my teens which is quite alarming let that be a warning to you I think the only difference is you have a better understanding of how the general world works but it still doesn't lessen some spikes well, it does it lessens some and you know some things you don't care about anymore and then other things you care about even more than you used to do it's it's a funny Takes all sorts. There we go. Just trying to get that snood a little bit more. Um, on the body. There we go. Um, obviously the arm is a completely wrong shape. And the body is really... Let me try and just see what happens. So I'll move that forward and back. There's something not quite right about it generally. I think that might be because of the construction of the body, uh, the uh, arms and things. Let me just work on that now. So with her, she has a sort of pucker that happens midway and then it goes small again, you see, like that. And it's actually in the opposite direction. I think that's probably the reason why I'm struggling because the thick and thin is happening in the wrong way. That's a little nicer, yeah. Ignore the hand placement, we'll sort that out in a minute. Uh, right. Get that out there. It's... I. Th the thing I find difficult to relate to younger people with, and I don't think this is all younger people, because, I mean, even that's a ridiculous thing to say, isn't it? Young people today. It's just like, oh, what the hell's that? Uh, it's like old people today. That's you know. Once you talk to there's there's common there's unifying things, but it's it's a bit silly to think of people in this grouped way. But anyway, um, <laughs> uh, I think I can't get as excited by certain things as they seem to do. Um, but I don't know if that's me as a person or me as an age. Um, I'm pretty certain there are people my age who also did get excited about things in an over-the-top kind of a way. But um, I think there was more cynicism. Um, but I don't know. Again, there's so many examples of that. I don't know. It... I mean, my generation was the sort of first one to be introduced to the concept of climate change in a big way, recycle this and think of the planet that. And it was all talk, even at the time. It was all, oh, we're, you know, we're, we're a very responsible company. We're doing the best to save the planet. And you think, OK, how do I 
Like, what do I do? And the, you know, the the advice would be, well, put a brick in the system, <laughs> things like this, to save on water. Uh, and I asked my mum, mum, can we put a brick in the system? So you don't need to. We've already got a, a very efficient flush and things like that. It was all very top level stuff because most of it is really, certainly when you're a child. Um, we wanted to recycle, but, you know, you couldn't at the time. It's only fairly recently in the last mm, 15 years. Not even that, really. Um, no, I wouldn't even say it was 15 years. I'd say it was more 13 years or something. Um, that recycling has been, you know, de rigueur for Britain. You know, it, it really wasn't, you know, it, you didn't have to do it. You have to do it now. You get bins put out with different colours and stuff. And I'm sure in other countries this has been the norm for a lot longer than us. But it, you know what I mean? It's not a new, it's not a, an old thing. It's a fairly new concept for Britain. Things like that. And um, again, my generation wanted to do these things. And I suppose it's my generation that has instigated it. They've been in a position possibly of putting pressure on and say, right, okay, we're adults now. Please, can you make this mandatory because we want it? Um, Gen X, sort of, in my case, it's Xennial, I'm sort of in between the two. Um, but, um, you know, I think, because I don't really fit into any category, that's the problem. I don't fit into so many categories. I, that's why I've never been a big group joiner, really. I just don't get it. I don't get groups. Um... Other people do, and they seem to find solace in it, and good for them. I'm not knocking them. I'm just saying I don't ever seem to fit into any group. I don't even fit into my own country, particularly. Um, you know, Brexit, what's that? It doesn't fit for me. And again, I'm not knocking people that vote whatever direction. It's just I don't... It, it didn't fit... The idea of Brexit for me didn't fit into the Britain that I thought we were going to be part of. Um, if you look at 2012 Olympics, that was the direction I thought things were going. This sort of, you know, in a rose-tinted kind of a way, kind of Richard Curtis-y kind of multicultural, brightly coloured, you know, for want of a better world, utopia... <laughs> <laughs> where you know I, I hate I hate you know hesitate to use that word because you're already setting yourself up for a fall, but that idea of us pulling together and we finally sort of it looked as if racism was finally coming away and you know you've got some you know disability people with disabilities finally not being seen as some sort of I mean back when I was a kid you know disabled people were really seen as some sort of you know add on. It's like, oh, you know, and help the poor, help the poor a disabled child with its, you know, they would be thought of as its back then, you know, it's much more. And now, you know, people are just seen as people for a change, which is nice. But there was much more of a sense of that with the 2012 Olympics. It did seem to crystallise a new way of looking at things. And ironically, at Boris Johnson as the mayor of London waving his flag around it all. And now we seem to have been going increasingly in another direction, which is so alien to people of my generation. I know it's of comfort to people of a, an older generation, and I understand why, and I'm not, again, I'm not going to knock it in any direction. That's another kind of debate. Um, but it is alien for me, and it is a bit scary. It's not something that I thought we were going to evolve into. And it's... I think in terms of identity, it's actually proven to be quite a tricky thing to to get my head round, really. Um, annexed out of a larger group of people in some form that I actually quite liked. Now, in terms of the running of the EU and everything, you know, that's another debate that the... the um, Ah, the the bureaucracy and all that sort of stuff. I don't think anybody can sort of ignore that. Um, but in terms of an identity, I did consider myself, you know, 
British European really and I still do and it feels like oh, I've been shut away from that and that's that is sad you know it's as simple as that um, you know I don't want to go on about it too much but I think certainly with the pandemic and everything you do find yourself reflecting on things that you know not that long ago were considered norms and now are considered exotic strange things it's um it's a bit difficult now in terms of how i'm going to join that neck onto the snood i might have to do another bit of a snood that comes over it for this character because i don't think the neck on its own is going to cut it and it might actually look a bit odd in some angles so um you know don't know yet and also, I, do, I don't want the shape of the body to be this. This is too lumpy-bumpy for her. She has more of a structure going on, I think. So I'm just going to... I mean, we're not talking about breasts, but we are talking just something to change the shape of it a bit. Um, there we go, like that. And then, oops, and then there, like that. Um, I just have to keep, let's see what it would look like down here. It's hard to tell as well with these enormous hands. I mean, I could, <laughs> I could, uh, oh, how have I got that here? I could make different hands for her. I'm not saying no, but, um, her hands are probably going to be smaller. Um, if I duplicate that and put it onto the other hand, oops, ah, plug that one in and then get rid of that one. Yeah. Okay, okay. There we go. That's uh, slightly wrong, isn't it? Um, lower nail. I see. Oh, yes, because the nail, yeah. So if I do the artwork for that, if I move it back, and just change that, there we go, like that, then the nail's in the right place, and then I can move that back, and then that should be, yeah, more or less, yeah, in the right place there. <coughs> Same with the other one. Go back there, move that back. There we go, like that. Right. Let's do... still think the arms need a bit of work. Oops, there we are. Right, so... Uh, Okay, and then the wrinkle. There we go, like that. The line work. Just gonna get that down. Because we're dealing with a deformation and a and a pig transformation it's slightly tricky to put these things in the right place I still think those cuffs are a bit wide so let's try and get them down so boom and boom that's more like it and then try to sort of just flatten it out Okay, I think that's going to be the best we can get out of that, and then I'll just have to make those hands even smaller. Same with that one. Same with that one. Do do. Same with that one. Oh no, I better say that. Um, right. Okay. <laughs> Copyright strike. Um, right, okay, I think we're, we've got something that's going in the right direction with her. 
Now I'm going to do her hair, which is, um, where did I put her hair? Oh yeah, I've got rid of her, her hair entirely, haven't I? So let us, the hair would be here, wouldn't it? So, uh, call it um, hair M, because I want to do that great big bouffant bit first. And that will be the middle bit. So I'll split it into three parts of hair. And put a composite on there as well. Excuse me. And plug that in. And then, uh, like all these other things, attach it to the upper head. Um, there we go, like that. Uh, stick a peg on it. If you like it, then you better stick a peg on it. And there we go. Move that over there. Like that. There we go. Now what I'll do um, is just quickly group that. There we go. And then like that and then I've got got it all there and then I can actually start drawing now so um, I'm gonna just use a rectangle that's always quite good and uh, let's have a look at her hair so the mate the basic lozenginess of it all is that I suppose it starts about there comes over about there and does that. There we go, like that, that sort of thing. Um, what I need to do as well is bring that to the fore, because it is actually a structure that is right on top of everything. I'm just gonna move the pivot to there, I think. Makes sense. Now, um, because this is the overall structure, I'm just gonna fatten that and thin, oops, thin those down, fatten that, and thin that down. And then because I want a sharp edge, well maybe I don't, maybe I don't in this case. Um, I'm gonna keep that line, but that line stops. And instead of breaking this lovely shape up, what I'm gonna do is just pinch it at this point, and then also pinch it at that point as well. There we go. And then we've got that shape. What I can do now is fill in the hair and then we keep, we retain the rest of that shape. Now what I'm also going to do is move it back until those eyebrows come back. So I'll have to move that eyebrow forward. That's it. And then we've got something that's a bit similar now her eye cuts through that hair, so um, what I want to happen is, I mean that sort of works actually, but I quite like the fact that the black of that cuts through there. So because I know what the colour of that is, I'm going to just use uh, colour select, and from that one only, I don't think I want it happening anywhere else. And I'm going to use that later. So I'm just going to select the colour that's coming through, Olivia outline. There we go. And that I can use to then go over the eyes. Um, so the eyes are coming over here. So if I pull that over there, there we go, like that. So that's kind of handy, just getting that extra line there. And then I might calm it down a little bit because it's a little bit over the top like that and then also like this because I think that needs calming down that one there we go like that can we move that a little bit more there we go I think that's looking not bad um, let me just find that as well. 
So on the overlay art, um, where are we? yeah, on the overlay art, I'm going to do some of those quick flex here. So fleck, oh, it's the wrong color. Uh, right, fleck, 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 fleck. Oops, fleck. Oops. Again, fleck, 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 uh, fleck, 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 and fleck. I think that's virtually it. I can always make some adjustments anyway, like, for example, that little wiggle it does there, I quite like. So I'm just going to try to recreate that. And then this one, there we go, like that. That one, there, like that. Um, Virtually it. Um, yeah, I think that's not, that's not bad. Um, so you've got all those flecks with the hair. Um, let me just go back to where that is. There. So we've got the hair there, the hair bear bunch. And then I need to put some side hair on as well. Dum de dum de dum. I'm trying to think of anything else to talk about. I saw Paddington again on Netflix, uh, the British animated film. Really loved that film. It's one of those films that, what's lovely about it as well is that it was, I remember the publicity for it and every, initially everyone hated it. Oh, Paddington, oh my goodness, he looks absolutely, look at how demonic he looks. <laughs> um, and then he just melted everybody's hearts, particularly when, um, uh, now, who was the voice of him? Um, Benjamin, is it Benjamin? Um, which, ben Witchell, sorry. Um, ben Witchell did the voice of him. It was just the perfect voice for such a gentle, sweet-natured character. Um, and they captured the atmosphere perfectly because it could have been just a sufferific nightmare of ultra-cute nonsense. Because uh, I have to admit, things like... I'm, I was never that keen on Stuart Little. Um, and that's not dissimilar in the sen in the subject matter, is it, really? Um, but there's something about Paddington that I found just got the tone really right. And it's not an easy thing to do that and get it right. Um, because the characters are so sweet, you could potentially hate them. <laughs> you know, think, oh, my God goodness not this lot again but actually you know you i found really love them and um it's uh, it, it's a testament to how well it's brilliant direction brilliant um acting uh from a very likable cast you just want to yum up more and more and the clever thing i noticed about it is that the structure um is quite straightforward so every day trying to get one of those loops in there um, every day, doesn't matter what the adventure that he's had during the day is, at the end of the day, he always goes back home. And then in the morning, they have breakfast as a family and they discuss what crazy things they're going to do the next day. So even though there's a sense of an ongoing plot, there is also this sense of just enjoying family life. And I love the fact that that's in there because it's tempting for when you do a feature film of something to not put those elements in as if they're not relevant. You know, come on, we need to have the main plot with the with the uh, the heist and the this and the that. And there's there's a lot of times things happening over nothing at all, and he makes them into something totally bonkers. You know, um, it's funny. I think there was a similar love for. And this might surprise some of you, Mr. Bean on Holiday. I've never seen the first Mr. Bean film. Apparently that's supposed to be quite bad. And I have to admit, I'm not that keen on Mr. Bean generally. But Mr. Bean on Holiday, 
I think because they paired him up with a child, it actually made him rather... It, it made the film more sweet. There was something of the Jacques Tati about it, which I rather liked. Um, I've got to, I think I've got to just draw this manually. Um, it, it evoked old-fashioned films for me, and I rather liked that. Again, it's not not everybody's going to like it, um, but it it surprised me because I thought it was going to be terrible, and I found myself just watching it on when it was on TV, thinking, oh, "Okay, what's this?" And then thinking, "Oh, actually, I want to know what happens," you know. Um, so, gosh, this is going to be tricky to re recreate what I did here. <laughs> um, okay, so. Uh, I'm trying to do it in a way where I can sort of join the edges up. Um, there we go. I'll go with that, I suppose. Uh, saw the new Bond film. Really liked that, actually. Contrary to what a lot of the moaning people are saying. Oh, I don't like it, any Bond. <laughs> well, I quite liked it. What are you expecting from a Bond film? These are. I prefer these to the original ones that are pretty... That's what that's my advice, I think. Um, I don't like the original. Well, um, that's, that's a bit strong. I don't mind the original Bonds, but they're silly films. They're yeah. silly films. Um, they've got quite a lot in common with Carry On films, I think. Um, I'm sure they had more connection with them than just being filmed in Britain. There's something, especially in the Roger Moore cases, there's something very similar about the humor in them you know you've got the the but the um pigeon that does a double take and all of this silliness you know it just gets silly um so i don't know it, it uh i'm i'm really happy about the the new bond films but of course daniel craig's now no longer going to be in them anymore so that's going to be an interesting legacy to follow i don't know where it's going to go now um and the big news of uh, Doctor Who, the fact that Russell T. Davis is taking over the franchise once Chibnall's departed is quite a, quite a surprise. A happy surprise. I, I thought his he made Doctor Who for me. Um, I'm not that bothered about Doctor Who. I, I, yeah, I'm one of those sort of lukewarm fans where I like it, but I'm not desperately in love with it, whereas my partner absolutely adores it, you know, and has actually worked on it, you know. Um, uh, as have I, but not in quite the same way. Um, but uh, he, yeah, he um, he really is into it in a big way. But uh, and has been for like since he was a little tot, you know. Um, but I think, um, yeah, Russell T. He injected it with something else, which I think the series has sort of hinted at but never quite been able to have until he came along which was a sense of grandeur um and um and emotional re repartee i mean the, his stories more than any of the other writers i think are so emotionally charged i mean how on earth can you get a writer to manage to make you feel sympathy for a stretched piece of skin i mean honestly you know he's just got the knack for <laughs> putting across these incredibly intense ideas um with uh seeming ease he always seems to do it doesn't matter what he writes he always seems to manage to do it because he's got so much empathy in him um, so fantastic writer, and I'm glad he's back. Be interesting to see what happens to the entire franchise as a whole, actually, because it's going to be taken over by uh, Bad Wolf Productions, whatever that really means. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Is that on Ola? Oh, just mm, cut that off and put that into line art. There we go. And then we've got these. Whoops. To do. No, that's right. That's right. And then we got that, and that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so it'd be interesting to see what happens when um, when he uh, there we go when he um, takes over properly. Um, it'd be fascinating to see. I don't know if I need any hair on the other side yet. Uh, let me just certainly need to have the pivot in the right place. 
Uh, let me just pop her ear in where I think the right place is. There we go, like that. Looking quite nice. Um, let's see what happens when I do that. Yeah, looks fine to me. Ignore that mouth. I think that'll be all right because that hair is so enormous you're not going to see the other side particularly and she's not going to gesture away that far that you're going to see it. I, I think we're okay. Um, worst case scenario, I can add it later. It's not a big fundamental part of the character. Um, okay, let me just see what she looks like from there because that's because of the table that's largely where she's going to be sat and if I move her forward like that then obviously her head is going to be more like that. I think her body, her head is actually larger in relation to her body than Robert's is. So I think that's part of the part of the issue I'm having actually. Let me just move that back like that. Maybe that's part of the I wouldn't say problem, just issue. That's it, she looks quite cute. Uh, and then if I move her head... Ah, that's part of it, isn't it? So if I move that forward, there we go. And then if I move that there... Change that round, there we go, like that, that's better. Ah. What's going on there? Okay, there must be something fundamental to the structure of this that I've I've ruined. Um, it's probably that um, peg that I changed. Yeah, oh, I'll fiddle around. It's probably doing it with the other one as well. Yeah. Uh, I think it's probably this. If I change the pivot to that, does it now move in relation... Uh, not sure. Don't know. That's something to figure out. Um, if I get rid of it, then I move this. So that's correct. So is this doing the prop, doing the uh, making it an issue? Um, if I keep it like that, but then have that on there, let's see. Ah, oh, that looks as if it fixes it, so all I have to do now is just move it down. Ooh. These pegs can be a bit awkward sometimes. There we go. So I'll have to do the same with the other one. Oops. Turn that back. Plug that in there, and then I need to move it back to a better place. Whoopsie doo. There, that'll do. I can make some adjustments later, it's not a big deal. I just want to get a rough idea of what's going on. Um, so, if I put her hands there, like that. Right, so we're getting that problem of the overextension of the arm. That's it, like that, there we go. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, because her arms are, oh, there we are. Oh, that's better. I do think I need to do something with that snood generally in this area because that's going to come up again and again, that, um, you know. Is her colour organdy, I wonder? That'll make somebody I know laugh. Um, there's a piece of music in a film by, uh, written by Dr. Seuss called The Five Thousand Fingers of Dr. T. And uh, in it, the character has... I'd better move that pivot point, actually. Um, in it, a character um, is uh, a very camp villain, so it's always quite entertaining, um, has uh, a choice of umpteen different clothes and they have them put on them uh, by their various servants and one of the things that they have is an organdy snood this comes up in the uh, lyrics of the song what on earth is the colour of organdy it's 
it really is one of those lyrics that's only there because it rhymes with something or it fits the the rhythm of the song now i would ah this is where i'm going wrong oh, there's something in the character design i'm thinking well there's something wrong here there we go i need i need that thing back like there you know that's it that's that's more like it and is that there yeah it just doesn't look right otherwise there we go that's better that's better because it subtly gives the sense of of boob without actually having a boob that's just the way she is you know it not that it was a very conscious decision to do that but um i think it definitely makes her look more feminine there we go um and then i've just got to put a mouth on there like that I'm quite impressed at how well that's worked because her structure, by and large, is okay. It's just the mouth I've got to um, put on it now properly. I've got to take a mouth and put it on. Um, but uh, I'm not going to do it in this video because that's uh, something for another video. I've been working on a mouth system to allow this and I've shown you it earlier. But suffice to say, it uh, requires a bit of wiring up. But the great thing is, once you've built the mouth, you largely bung it in. You don't really have to sort of do anything other than pop the mouth in and then just wire it up and then make some sort of positional uh, uh, keyframes. Obviously, because, you know, when I create this character, I'm going to have uh, a full, you know, master controlled head turn. But and so you have to make sure that the mouth works within that. But pardon me, in terms of actually putting a mouth in, it's not an awful lot of work, and it can do all those wonderful things of um, you know making all the different mouth shapes customizable, which is great. I you know the closest I've ever been able to get to that was when I made a bus stop, and that was using something called a um, stack wizard. And the problem with that is that you have to create not just one grid. Oh, ignore all that. You, have, you don't just create one grid for the mouth. If anybody's ever done a master controller, you know you've got to create a grid uh, for each head position, and you have like position one, position two, position three, four, five, whatever. And then the computer is able to work out the relationship between the grid points. But with a stack wizard, you have to create several grids, and then it can compute the difference between them which is great but if you want to quickly make a mouth it is a nightmare because you've got to update all of these grids if you want to make one small change you have to update all of the grids it is not desirable to do it's a lot of work whereas this method is very it's easier to work with better and faster to, to set up so you know on the whole it's, it's a delight so on the whole i'm pleased with where she's gone um, and you'll be able to see the full piece of that. I'm, I'm going to put up some more things of me working on her and uh, animating the actual show soon. But uh, stay tuned for that. This is a shorter episode because it's actually, you know, I'm, I'm now done, I think, with most of it. Except, um, actually, let's just check, see whether her her blinks are intact. You never know. Ah, they are really, aren't they? The only thing I've got to do is, check, is um, accommodate that. So I'll probably have to put, um, a triangle onto there somehow so that that will require a bit of work but on the whole that's not bad at all is it what does it look like when it's rendered yeah it's not bad there's a few flecks and bits and pieces which i'm going to have to get rid of obviously the color of the blink itself needs to be the same as the flesh but um yeah that's not bad yeah not bad at all that so um yeah, I'll figure something out, I'm sure. I hope. Uh, <laughs> I hope, actually, thinking about it, how am I going to do that? Don't know. Because what has to happen is that the eyes there then have to say, I'm no longer part of the eye, I'm now doing the blink side of things. So, I don't know. Hmm. Might not be as easy as I think. I think the the black part's fine. That's easily um, alt. Oh, 
Well, there you go. That's the end of the episode. <laughs> Thanks, Toon Boom, for crashing. And, uh... <laughs> yeah, hope to see you soon. Uh... <laughs> Take care and... Uh... Yeah, you'll see uh, some more interesting work on this project very soon. Bye.